Today we're going over the different types of lipids, and one thing to keep in mind when we're talking about the free fatty acids, which actually we didn't just have any big discussion on just a moment ago, uh, we talked about the degree of saturation, and if they were monounsaturated, polyunsaturated versus fully saturated, and the effects that it has on physical properties, or the saturated fats, or the quote unquote bad fats. Monounsaturated is better, and then polyunsaturated typically is the best, but once you take up the grain of salt, you have too much of anything to be bad for you. And there's also the uh, some research that talks about, you know, uh, that some of these fats can go haywire, so to speak. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Like, for example, if you look at arachidonic acid, arachidonic acid means it makes the acrosinoids, but certain acrosinoids, if you have too much of them, then they the bad things that have to do with inflammation. Okay. All right. And then we talked, and we just showed the picture to show how this does contribute to you know things like atherosclerosis, plaque formation. Um, were you in class that didn't know what atherosclerosis was? Yeah, I've never heard of them on atherosclerosis. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or was it? I don't know. It may have been the nursing class. One of them that I was talking about atherosclerosis. No one in their heads. So the hardening of the arteries, okay? And so, yes, plaque. Plaque formation. Matthew Scales had better know what that is because otherwise he's going to have problems with his capstone. Okay. Okay, and then we talked about the fact that we had triglycerides. It's a common term, kind of like a familiar term for it, but the triglycerides. They have glycerol backbone. There's an ester linkage. I would expect you to be able to draw these. And you don't have to have three identical fatty basal groups hanging off of this the, the triglyceride. They can be a mixed triglyceride. Okay. And then we talked about food composition, talked about trans fats, how they were bad because of the fact that they have such high boiling points and melting points, they are not endogenously endogenously uh, made by plants and then part of your diet, or even for animal products, to be honest, okay? So it's not like if, you know, a pro vegan thing versus an anti-vegan thing. And so they are derived from partially dehydrogenated oils, which were used primarily to make it uh, better shelf life, and they were long-lasting and stuff like that. So they do margarines and things. But now the government actually recommends that you have zero trans fats in your diet. Okay. And there are certain municipalities for years now that have eliminated it, because it's relatively easy to eliminate trans fats in your diet. And so it's not like it's that, that difficult to do. Okay. So this, this table here in the U.S. is most likely outdated, because a lot of the big fast food restaurants have already eliminated trans fats. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we talked about lipids, why we use lipids, and there were two main reasons. I know I'm in biochemistry. All right. The two main reasons for the fact that the lipid versus the sugar is already fully reduced or highly reduced as the sugar is more oxidized. So therefore, we get more energy per unit of, uh, of lipids than sugar since it's through oxidative phosphorylation. The electron transport will change and so, secondly, just the fact of the state of hydration. Since sugar has all those alcohol groups hanging off of it, they're going to be bringing in um, water through hydrogen bonding, where it's fat completely excludes it, or essentially excludes it. Okay, so therefore, mole per mole, you wouldn't have to carry in so much water. We really would be retaining water, be very heavy if we were solely sugar-based for our energy source. Okay. All right. Are there any questions on that before we start with the next big class? Yes. So you said between lipids and sugars, say that again, why? It's why, why, why now? Why lipids are better stored? There are two reasons. The one oh, I mean for, for energy. Mm -hmm. for the, there are two reasons. One has to do with the fact that the lipids are more reduced. Or you can say the sugars are more highly oxidized. <clears throat> so, since we make ATP through a 
process called oxidative phosphorylation. It's part of the electrochemical chain. You want things that are more reduced. You get more energy out of them, since you have to oxidize them. If it's already oxidized, you don't get as much energy. Links number two. Is that sugars have alcohol groups, right? And fats typically don't. So the sugars, since they have alcohol groups, are hydrated. They bring in water via their hydrogen bonds. And so it would weigh, you would literally weigh a lot. You have a lot of water, which water is not energy. Whereas fat excludes it. They're hydrophobic, so they don't want water to come along with them. And so you just have that energy source. <clears throat> Okay. The next big broad class are the structural lipids, and then there are subclasses within each of these. Some of this may look familiar to neurochemistry since we are in some of this. This is a small one. <clears throat> you should know that's the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> Not the one in the <laughs> Even though I was really disappointed by the Eiffel Tower personally when I went. So, I don't know, has anyone else gone to the Eiffel Tower? I was disappointed. And so, it was at least whenever I went there, only two of the four elevators were working. Oh. You had to wait, so I waited for hours and hours and hours. And what they don't tell you is you wait for a long period of time at the bottom, and then you can only go up to each other three bases. This is the first stop, the second stop, and then the third stop. And so, you pay based off of how much space you go. You have to then get off here and wait in line again for the next elevator to go up to the next, get up here, this is where the restaurant and stuff is. And you have to wait in line for a long period of time. And they told us by the time I next started in the morning, this was mid, late afternoon or the evening. And they already told us that once you get up there, it's a minimum of a two hour wait to come back down that day. Because this I'm in summer. I was like, dear Lord, it'd be like all night long stuck up there at the top of there and like a tower. So and but yeah, I, so I just I, just, I went to the second base. Went to the second base of the elevator. I was like, I don't know how that did it. What a thing! Okay, I'm sure my fans will all love that one. Now that I totally got your attention. <laughs> So what do you suppose the structural lipids are going to be making up? Structures. structures. What kind of structures in vivo? Membranes. We're going to be talking about membranes. Not all membranes are created equal. Wait a second. I was going to... All right. Okay. So are the triglycerides good for building membranes? Why or why not? That's a good kind of question to ask. Would they make very good... I don't think they... But they make very good membranes. No. no. Okay. Why not? They don't stack very well. Possibly. What else? Think about what, what does a membrane do? What, does, what can membranes really do? Selectively permeable. They're selectively permeable. What are they selectively permeating? Or <laughs> permeating? Stuff coming in and out of the cell. Okay. What kind of environment's on the inside of the cell? It's aqueous. What kind of environment is on the outside of the cell? Is it aqueous still? It, it's aqueous as well. Okay. So now, <laughs> but what kind of properties are the membranes? They're what? They are amphipathic. And so they have to have a head group or a part that's going to be more, more, it's not really hydrophilic, but more hydrophilic, and then they're going to really exclude on the inside of the membrane itself. And so that's why we have the, the bilipid, the bilayer of the membrane. It's taking forever to get this open. <clears throat> so now we think about why would the triglycerols not be very good? This is really sick. Why would they not be very good? Because they don't have a polar head group? Their head group would not be very polar. 
right? It's chromium carbons. Yes, you have the linking oxygens, but it's not really all that all that polar, okay? And so they're not going to be the best choice. They're really great for energy, right? But they really are not the best choice, okay? All right. So I got this figure out of your book. I really like it. You just have to learn how to, like, what it, it may take a little bit of a moment for you to understand what's going on. We've actually already talked about the story a little bit. They're neutral. That's one of the reasons why they're not. They don't have that polar head group. So, what would be the head group? Whoops, sorry. Would be this, the glycerol backbone. Okay, and then they've got three fatty acids. Whereas the membrane lipids, they are polar. Okay. They're still overwhelmingly hydrophobic, but they're, they are going to have polar portions. And so we're going to break it down. I, I'll just briefly go over the archaebacterial because we focus more on those that, since it's for, for the biomedical field. So, okay. So first up, we're going to talk about what most people think of if we ask. We'd say, oh, you have a phospholipid membrane. That's true with the little asterisk. All of our members are not completely phospholipid. What are some of the other components of the membrane? Cholesterol. Cholesterol. Cholesterol is the baby. Uh, you could even mention the fact that there are proteins that have to do with, we had to do with the wraps and stuff that we'll cut up in the next chapter as well. Okay, so the glycerol phospholipids, or the phosphoglycerides, that, like I said, that's probably what most of you are thinking of when if I had to ask you, draw me or discuss or write, that's what most people are. And some may know about sphenolipids, some may not. Those in your chemistry should know a little bit more about sphenolipids, and we'll talk about them in great detail. Sphenolipids, please note, not all sphenolipids are phospholipids. Some of them are called glycolipids. Okay. Which what do you suppose a glycolipid is? What does it have? Glyco means sugar. Phospho means phosphate. <clears throat> so there are two types of sphenolipids. Alrighty. If you have the old edition of this textbook, there is the typo. Okay, at least from the, I think the eighth edition is correct. It only has to do with the um, stereochemistry. I wouldn't ask you to draw it based off of the stereochemistry, but I'm just letting you know that there is a typo. Because if I remember right, yeah, so remember the, this is technically be a D, because the alpha is on the right, and they call it an L, okay, you go this way, it's, so the alcohol should be on the left, it should be L, I don't see it, it's not, I don't want to say it's not that important, it's not that important here for what we're going to talk about, if you're the enzyme or sign, it'd be important for to get the idea, it's not that important. Okay, so this is a glycerol fossil. Uh, uh, this is glycerol phosphate. <laughs> okay, so we have the glycerol backbone, hopefully you can see that, and then one of the alcohols has been, re has been replaced by the phosphate. So this is the, the backbone of the, the glycerol, uh, the phosphoglycerides. Okay. This is an example. This is a generic way of writing. So please note, typically, we're going to have, in the first position, a saturated fat. Typically, you're going to have an unsaturated fatty acid for the second position, many times. <clears throat> and then in the third position, you got the phosphate, which is what, where it gets its name. The phosphate is negatively charged. And then there's this X group that hangs off of the other oxygen. Okay. The name or the type of the phospholipid depends on this X group. Okay. <clears throat> and please don't memorize all of these. I would give you the table if I specifically had asked you to draw a specific one. But if I just asked you to draw a generic, you would just have to put a saturated and unsaturated in the phosphate. <clears throat> but see, the X can get quite elaborate. Okay, so 
let's just, I'm trying to think of where to start. If it's just a hydrogen, so the simplest is phosphatidic acid. So that X is just a hydrogen. So overall has a negative one charge. Phosphatidyl ethanolamine has an ethanolamine group there. This is ethanolamine, which has a positive charge on the amine. But remember, it still has a negative charge on the phosphate. So just think back to the beginning of the semester. You have a negative one and a positive one. Overall, it's zero, but that still means it's going to be polar. It's a zwitter ion. Okay. Likewise, you could have phosphatidylcholine, which has a choline group. And this is what choline looks like. And you probably have heard of choline and phosphatidylcholine. You know, if you're pregnant or you might become pregnant, it's good to have choline. So increase your choline intake. Okay. <clears throat> so a lot of prenatal vitamins. It's a really good, we'll talk about like having choline um, or DHA, which is the only thing that's really good to have there. And of course, folic acid, which is always potato. All women should be folic acid. Phosphatidyl serine, this one's very, very important. It has a serine that's attached. Okay. And the reason why this doesn't, you know, this doesn't look like serine, but remember, that's an oxygen that's the point of attachment, so that's what makes it a serine. So it's like the end of the serine, of the artery. We're gonna, does anyone know offhand why phosphatidylserine is so important? What is it involved in? It's part of the membrane, or it can be part of the membrane. I don't know if we talk about it next chapter or not. Or it may not be until next semester. I can't remember that's right around it. Phosphat oh, I bet it's next I bet it's next chapter. Phosphatidylserine is one where it matters which side of the membrane it's on. Whenever a cell is in trouble and it needs to die, one of the ways it signals that for cell death to occur is it flips the phosphatidylserine from the inner layer, inner leaflet, to the outer layer, outer leaflet of the membrane. And so then the cell death is signaled. So if you have too much phosphatidylserine on the outside of the cell, it's all she wrote. <clears throat> phosphatidylglycerol has another glycerol, so it's huge. Phosphatidyl, uh, one of those phosphatidyl inositols. <laughs> has this big old nosotol biophosphate. Uh, and then cardiolipin, of course it's a heavy nice one. It actually is a phosphatidyl, phosphatidyl glycerol. So it's huge, huge. So we have one phosphatidyl group, we have another phosphatidyl group, then we have glycerol. So it's, you can see that they can vary in their charge, they can vary in their size. You can imagine how big and bulky this one would be, or even this one, versus phosphatidic acid. Now we'll just look at some of these. So right there, that's, phos that's what phosphatidylcholine looks like. I don't know if it comes up very well. I can't tell. There's a nitrogen in there. In here. There's a nitrogen. So hopefully this shows you the reason why it's, this would be the outside of the cell or the inside of the cell. <laughs> I should say this is the part that's either going to be exposed to the extracellular space <laughs> or the cytosol. So if you notice, it's very, it has much more polar groups and it's going to be positively charged as well as negatively charged. So we can see where it would be much more, more hydrophilic than if it was just a plain glycerol back there. Okay. So the enzymes that cleave these, so lipases, technically the triacylglycerol, triacylglycerols, which are many times called tags, abbreviation. Phospholipases cleave phospholipids, and they are very, very specific. And we talked a little bit about, remember, in your history, and I couldn't remember the numbering system. I remembered it was odd. But if you notice, it don't ask, I don't know where D went. I have no earthly idea. Phospholipase A1 cleaves the ester at the carbon 1 position. Phospholipase A2 does it at the 2 position. And then the only difference between C and D is which side of the phosphate gets attacked. Okay. So C, whenever it, whenever it attacks, since it's max here, this would be the leaving group. And so then we'd be left with the an alcohol here at this end that could go on, which technically is called a diacylglycerol, uh, which I kind of doubt anyone from New York chemistry would remember this, but diacylglycerols or diacylglycerides are actually a secondary messenger or can be. Whereas if D attacks from here, this 
the X group is what leaves, and you would be left with, with what would, could become phosphatidic acid. Okay, so but they are very highly specific. All right. <clears throat> As a little side note, not all of them are ethylene. So that just kind of throws a wrench in there. There are some that are ether. And the identity of the fatty acid can change too. Don't memorize these. Just know that they are possible. Or if I asked you to draw like an example of an ether or something, like that, I would expect you to know your functional groups. What makes an ether an ether? What's the, its abbreviation when you're abbreviating? You know how alcohol is R O H. What's an ether? R O R. Okay. And so instead of being the ester, here's plasmologen. And if you notice. Instead of having the ester at the top, it now has an ether. And it's an alkene, it's not an alkene. So. <clears throat> but it's still, otherwise, you know, it's still going to be very hydrophobic, that chain is. Um, but they, I don't know the answer why some are ether versus the vast majority are ester linked. I'm going to say that there are special ones. Um, here's one that is actually an alkene instead of an alkene. Once again, I would expect you to know. Or if I ask you to draw an acetyl group, you should know this is acetyl. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? Okay. Next up are the sphingolipids. Sphingolipids are cool. Okay. They do not have the throat of their backbone. It has sphingosine. Okay. I'm sure everyone knows what sphingosine looks like. Ha ha ha. Don't, I, I wouldn't ask you to memorize it. That, in the pink is sphingosine. Okay. You can see it kind of looks like what's wrong. So you can see why it would be utilized in the membrane. However, it has a very distinct um, one position. Is it where the glycerol would be? It's not an ester, or an ether for that matter. And then the second position is an amide. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, an amide. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yay. So we have our amide. We have just an alkene up here. It's very long. And then the third position is similar to glycerol. And so the X, once again, is what gives each sphingosine, or sphingolipid, I'm sorry, each sphingolipid its name. The simplest one is ceramide or ceramid. I've heard it pronounced both ways. This is where it's a hydrogen. Where are some of the sphingolipids? What kind of membranes are they often a part of? That's one example. And sphingomyelin, where do you see sphingomyelin? You should have had this in A and P, surely. The myelin sheets. What kind of cells are we talking about then? What system? The nervous system. Yes. So the same thing with ceramic or ceramide. That's not to say that there aren't any in other places, but they there are. And their the nervous system does have a higher concentration. <clears throat> That's. Then there are some like the ganglia sides at the bottom. What's one example of a ganglioside? Does anyone know? Your blood type. So the antigen, it's close to there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was, those are ganglioside. <clears throat> okay. So these get to be quite complex as well. So you can see where we have the glucosal cerebroside. Okay. Similar to what we talked about in um, neurochemistry, because I was hitting neurochemistry just the last week or so. Uh, you could have sugars. They have complex sugars. This is a disaccharide, but it can also go up to a tetrasaccharide. Or they can get very complex for the gangliosides. And we're talking very, very complex. And each of these sugars, their identity 
is highly conserved. Okay. It's like, well, I think I got a command from later on. Like the only difference between A, B, and O for the blood typing. It's very, very, very strict. This is what sphingomyelin looks like. So you can see it still has the same overall type of structure as the glyphs of the triglyphs, but once again, we have the head group or the head portion that would be more polar or charged, and then we have the hypophobic portions that are going to be sticking down to help make the membrane. <clears throat> Is that a trans connection there? There's Sonia as a trans, yes. Is it usually a trans or not? Um, I don't know offhand. It quite possibly would be. It's not a trans fat, though. Good question. Okay. And one thing is, anyone from this would be a good type for organic chemistry. Why would we not have to worry about that being a trans fat? What cannot happen there? What is it not? When you show the trans confirmation, I wish you me in I thought that I'd never noticed that before. I would have asked this more than anything to back my time. <laughs> what do you not have to worry about ever happening right there at that position? If, well, I can't not talk to you, let me go here. At this, because this is the important carbon, right? Um, or even this carbon, it doesn't really matter. Either, either of these carbons. What do you not have to worry about happening in order with respect to trans, for this being a trans fat? You can either say, well, what's missing or what couldn't happen. There's different ways of answering that question. First of all, we don't have a phospholipase or a lipase there that's going to cleave that. Why? What is this not, this carbon? Are you talking about carbonyl or something? Or it is not a carbonyl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is true. What else is it not? Well, if this was like if if this was a triglyceride, okay, remember triglyceride looks like this. I'm just gonna show you the top of the triglyceride or the top of the phospholipid. That's that first carbon. You know, there are hydrogens hanging off of it. There's an oxygen and this R. Whereas if I draw the sphingomyelin, its top carbon looks like this. Of course, there are hydrogens hanging off of it, and then it's an R. So, whoops. What can happen here at its top carbon that cannot happen here at this top carbon? Think about the role of, like, lipases. Whoops, what happened to that poor X? H, I mean. Whereas, if we made, let's say, time. if this was a trans fat, this one, whoops, if this one right here was a trans fat, we would have to worry, right? Because we have lipases and things that can come knock it off. Why don't we have to worry about that here for this one? Thank you. That was all you had to say. <laughs> yes. There's nothing that can leave. It's a carbon. Why does that do it? Being trans or cis? How does that? Hmm? No, like if we would have had to. Be more worried. I shouldn't say worry about it. Regardless, you shouldn't worry. But if it has, if it looks like this, I'm just gonna say trans. Okay, rather than trying to draw it all, all out, and this gets attacked, or this one. Either way, it doesn't really matter which one. Usually, it'd be this carbon right here. This get, that gets attacked. Then. Oh no, I, I drew it wrong. This one that gets attacked over here, then this would be the leaving group. When this leaves, then you're gonna have a trans fat that's uh -oh. attached to it. Here, we can't do that. This, this isn't a, a good leaving group. So you don't want trans, free trans fats? Exactly. Because okay. it's the free trans fats that are gonna get stuck right. in places. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's being the moment. All right, these are the ganglia sites. This is just some examples, and I wanted to focus on the, the first of all, they're very, very complex. Very, very specific. I can focus on here on the ABO blood typing, because if you notice, 
like it's literally the difference between life and death, but they are so highly specific. So remember, uh, it's not that important that you remember the identity, but remember the sugar code, the way that they did it is they did it color coded in different shapes and different sugars and stuff like that. So the only difference between them is they all have the ceramide, the ceramide, they all look the same, with the sphenocene and the fatty acid and all of that. They all look the same for the first four sugars. They all have one of the triangle sugars hanging off of it. The only difference, the O on the non juicing end has absolutely nothing, and the A and the B have two different but our, our amplifiers and stuff are so specific for a single sugar molecule hanging off of the, the gateway side that's the difference between life and death. So, this is not the only pattern in this side. They're used for cell cell signaling, they're used for recognition, so that way you can tell what's what for your immune system. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I used to always show that in forensic science, and I think that the beauty of it was lost on that. You know, like this is like on the microscopic side the way of looking at the Grand Canyon, which I realize is kind of like a misnomer, but you, know, you should be in awe. <laughs> Look here. God is so awesome the fact that we can have antibodies that are so specific that it can recognize a single sugar hanging off and be able to reject it. <clears throat> okay. So next up. And the structural lipid subclass with stairwells. Okay, this is cholesterol. I do want you to know the basic, the ABCD, the study of ABCD for the structure of the sterols. They're always the same. You have three, A, B, and C are always going to be six member carbon containing rings, and then B is a five member. On cholesterol, and many of them do have a large alkyl site hanging off of it. But what really changes are just like a little window dressing kind of things. Some of them will be like cholesterol has an alcohol here. That's the only, that's its polar head group, which isn't very polar at all because you know we have something so you know ridiculously hydrophobic that this little tiny alcohol here gets overwhelmed by it. <clears throat> Then you can have like ketone, ketone there instead, so then it's even less hydrophobic. I'm sorry, I'm saying not less hydrophobic, less polar. Okay. All right, what is cholesterol used for? What does it do to the membrane? We're going to talk about more Exactly. Usually the higher the cholesterol content, the more rigid that there are certain exceptions, but that's just a good deal. Some membranes are going to have more cholesterol than the others. What, how is cholesterol stored in your body? Do you know? We typically we don't store cholesterol like this. How does it get transported in your body? It doesn't get transported like this, typically. Mm -hmm. In what form? If you sometimes, if you if you have a really good blood test, sometimes they'll even have this, this, this these, these initials down there, which literally means it is a specific factor cholesterol. They are in the form of cholesterol esters. So your body actually to store them makes them even more hydrophobic. It takes this alcohol and turns it into an ester. Sometimes they may have put an acetyl group on it. Sometimes they can put a big old acyl group on it, so it's very hydrophobic. So that way, you exclude as much water as you possibly can. You get that cholesterol really high concentrations in a small location to the point where they can it can even crystallize. Um, they call it a cholesterol cyst, but that way you completely exclude water, and it makes it more better transport, better storage. <clears throat> and so that's why if you have a blood test, sometimes they'll say CE on it for cholesterol esters, like LDL. IDLs, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Then we have our odds and ends. I kind of, 
I don't think your bullet puts it in quite this order, but I did. So that just makes sense to me. We have the signals, which we begin next semester going over cells. I used to do it all in biochemistry one, like into chapter 12, which does kind of make sense because it kind of it literally 10, 11, 12 kind of all go together. So don't forget what you learned in this chapter or next chapter. Uh, however, when they shorten this semester, and especially this semester since we lost the engine of the hurricane, there's just no way it got, it got to where. I mean, I for chapter 12, I really like to take the time to focus on each of the cell signaling pathways, and I got to where I got to pull them out. So we went really fast. That's a major chapter. So last, starting last year, I just moved it to chat. I moved it to that uh, chapter two, and it worked out much better. <clears throat> so we'll go into a lot more detail with these. But we have the sphenolipids and the pips, often titled nonsoles, that are called the signaling cascades. We have arachidonic derivatives, arachidonic acid derivatives, which are called the eclosinoids. <clears throat> oh, I thought I fixed that. I think I did on yours, but I forgot to it. It should say parocrine, not parcrine. That's the whole way of saying it. Just like it should say hormones, it should be hormones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Parkman hormones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Parakrine hormones. And so we actually go over hormones in the next semester, the next semester as well. Biochemistry one, you're going to get all the different types. Biochemistry two, a lot of metabolic pathways. <coughs> the steroid hormones, such as sex hormones, for example, androgens, estrogens, and then we have vitamins A and D are also signaling. We have the Koch factors, stuff like vitamins E and K. And then we have one that doesn't belong to anything else. This is the pigment, this is the big carotene. Okay. So come next semester, this kind of thing will hopefully make a lot more sense to you. But everywhere where you see that little PIP, those are inositols. Okay. So up there at the top, Many times they're a part of the membrane or, or membrane adjacent, like they're peripheral to it. But what's really, I don't know, it's not really cool, and it's not just because they did my second rotation on it. But the PIP, if you notice a lot of times they'll say like PIP2, PIP3, PIP4, PIP5, <laughs> IP6, all those. It matters. Many years ago, they even had this little figure that looked like a little turtle. For the nonsitol, since it's got that tear conformation, like the sugar. It kind of does look like a turtle where all the alcohols are, and depending upon where the phosphate is, it does different things, and they're involved in different cell signaling pathways. So my second rotation at New Medical School was over in, uh, that was my third, sorry, my third rotation. It was in, it was over at the cancer biology building, but ironically I didn't work in cancer. That happened to me twice in my career. I worked in the cancer hospital and I didn't work in cancer. but. My second rotation was there, and I was working on the else called signaling pathways. And so it was involved in um, neurological disorders, like lithium malfunctioning and stuff like that. <coughs> okay. But this just, this just shows you how the pits, which are the little lightning bolts, can affect a whole host of different functionalities. Here are other ones. These are called dicosinoids. So arachidonate is arachidonic acid and sauce hydrogen. So it's got 20 carbons and four double bonds. So it's a PUFA polyunsaturated fat. <clears throat> it's, from, it's one precursor can make a whole host of different things, including phosphatidins, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes. I'm actually going to start with leukotrienes. Leukotrienes are uh, many times are involved in inflammation and also muscle, smooth, smooth muscle contractions. In fact, it's usually why it helps them to the anaphylactic shock. Okay, whereas the thromboxane has to do with blood clot formation. So we can see that they're closely related, but they have very different functions. And then we have prostaglandins. Okay. Prostaglandins have a whole host of different functionalities. Does anyone know why they're called prostaglandins? What does it sound like? Prostate. That's because it's first, and this is thing that stuck in my head. It was first um, isolated from sheep prostate, so they used to think it was only for like, male hormones. But as you can see, it actually is why it helps with the 
contractions. It sleep cycle temperature inflammation is a big one. Inflammation is pain. So if you notice, oh no, I did that earlier. What is G? What is inset? I got it on here. <coughs> non steroidal. Non steroidal. Anti inflammatory. Anti inflammatory. And the D is drugs. drugs. Okay, <laughs> so does anyone know what does that little X mean? They are the incidents or at. They're inhibitors. Okay. And so we're going to see that kind of stuff a lot next. Where, does anyone know what the sign is for if it was an activator? First of all, it's not red, it's green. But it's a little green triangle. When it talks about these metabolic pathways. Okay. These are inhibitors. And I thought I put the enzyme up there. But the initial enzymes that turn arachidonic acid, arachidonic, if you notice, they all have the cyclic head. You're kind of, to me, it's kind of elliptical, not really the triangle. But it kind of looks like this, little tadpoles. I don't know. See, this is the eyeballs and the nose. Okay, maybe not. But that's, that's a, it's called a cox enzyme, or cycle oxygenase enzyme. So then you make them start with you. <coughs> Inset is target cox enzymes. There's cox one and cox two. And we'll go into a lot more detail next semester about those enzymes. And I thought that I put that on there, but I didn't. Okay, the steroid hormones, we go into much greater detail for those. Um, on your own, you can look at them, you probably, you should have been, you should have been uh, used to seeing them earlier anyway. One thing, and so I'm not going to go into greater detail here, I'll let you look that up on your own, that part there. <clears throat> Next semester we'll talk a little bit more about them. I do want to spend like just the last minute or two right here on the isoprene. Isoprene unit is this. Does anyone remember from organic chemistry? What is it called when it goes double, single, double, single, double, single, double, single, double, single from double bonds? Conjugated dienes. What's so special about them? Resonance. Okay. They are more stable of sorts, but they're also more reactive in some sense. But they're also more reactive, too, in the sense that if you perturb it, the other end could be kind of like a nuclear fire. For a lot of lipids, this is their building block. Not every group could fall into it, but there's a lot. And so that's why when you look at a lot of your lipids, they are, um, these are five carbons, and so they'll have like, multiples of five. And for water, and I don't know why, whenever there's two of these groups put together and has 10, it's called a germinal group. Whenever there's three that are put together and there's 15, it's called a carnesal group. Whenever it's 20, it's 10 plus 10, so it's called germinal germinal. And so I don't know why they get that. But you get the idea. And so a lot of lipids and lipid tails and stuff that help anchor things to the membrane have these isoprene groups on them. And so your book will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, this just shows you an example using the carotene, the vitamin A also does, uh, so some does. But you can see it here. They kind of they've broken it down. Uh, and based off of the reactivity, they don't all necessarily end up looking like this kind of product. But they're all multiples of five. RAS protein, which if you had chemistry cancer or neurochemistry, we've talked about RAS, and next semester we'll talk about RAS in this class. Um, it has to be farnesylated, otherwise it's not active. So a lot of proteins have to be farnesylated or general lated in order for them to go to the membrane and be active. <clears throat> and these are just more examples of cofactors and how they how they put these isoprene units or isoprene tails on them. Okay, and there's just a whole host of these. We're going to talk a lot about the big one later. Yeah? So, um, what are the other lines? They said they mean isoprene. Units, That's the building block. So, so right eight, section. one, two, three, four, five. They literally use your body, actually, has synthesis. I'm sorry, the synthetases <coughs> that will use those isoprene units to, almost like Legos, to build on to make them bigger and bigger and bigger. Because since it's a conjugated diene, you think back to organic chemistry, we have one that has a positive group two at the end of one. So it swings out and attacks, it can swing out and attack the next one and it just alternates down. And so what will happen is you'll see these multiples of five. Oh, that's awesome. And this is ubiquinone. Ubiquinone, we'll talk a lot about next semester. It has a huge isoprene tail on it. How does it have double bonds so no? Because then you'll have other enzymes that will come through and make it go from double to single bond. Mm -hmm. To reduce. 
But uh, sometimes they'll also, actually, I don't see an example of that here, so I won't go there. All right. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and end class with prayer. That's the end of the chapter.